Hey, what's up guys? This is Rags and today I'm bringing you guys an interview with recording artist Alicia. Alicia is a super talented artist that has both worked independent as well as in labeled situations, who has toured and performed all over. Um, this was a phenomenal opportunity for me to help bring you guys some insight, especially as aspiring artists, into what the world of a musician is like, especially one that's had the experiences that she has. Uh, unfortunately, due to COVID-19, we didn't have the most optimal situation for recording, so we did this recording via Skype, but in any case, I hope that you guys enjoy. Hey, what's up guys? It is Rags, and today I have a very special interview for you guys. I have none other than Alicia here. And for those of you that may not be privy, well, you know what? Alicia, how about you introduce yourself? No problem. I am kind of just an all-around audio designer, is usually what I like to tell people. I produce music for people's ears as well as, well, I guess it's all for people's ears, but on the dance floor, in a video game, in a movie, any type of format where you might process sound, I have probably been there making sound for you. So at this point, I'm also a music professor uh, of technology and innovation. And as you know, we together help run the EDMP Discord. So all around, I would say I'm a sound engineer, music education, educator, the sound engineer, music educator, and producer. Yep, absolutely. And you know, it's interesting. I, I always bring this story up. Uh, you mentioned about how we manage that EDMP community, which is especially dope and it's been a huge part of my life, I will say. But um, even more so than that, I wouldn't have envisioned even being there because of the fact that I used to actually listen to your music a shit ton in college. And I wouldn't have thought that the artist that I was listening to at the time would be... Uh, you know, there would be a scenario where I'd actually get to meet them. Um, and we actually met at, what was the festival called? I forget, I remember the experience. It was, uh, it was in the, it wasn't quite Atlanta, but a surrounding area and there was a huge festival there. And we actually got to meet up and that was pretty dope. That was a pretty dope experience. I don't even remember how that whole thing even happened, but um, the fact that it did was pretty awesome. And that show was definitely awesome. I think I probably still got some of the snaps, but, Enough about that. Um, what I do want to talk about is music, and that's why we uh, that's why we're having this interview. I especially want to get to know a little bit more about you and about your music and what drives you and, and different factors in the realm of music and, and how it integrates in your life. Um, so the easiest basic question would be, what was your introduce, uh, introduction, excuse me, to music like, and, and what inspired you to get into it? I mean, I'm pretty lucky in the, the fact that I've had a musical family and been surrounded by, by it my whole life. And it has been in a different capacity. Uh, the background is very much classical, folk music, jazz, world music, you know, sort of more traditional aspects of music. But um, because of that, I've been sang to, I have been danced around with, you know, music is sort of the lifeblood of my family. There's always been some singing, and my family used to tell me that I would have hung when I was waking up from my naps. So I think for a long time, I've just processed things musically from the get-go, and um, became, let's see, I was in children's choir and I was in band, and I did all those things that, you know, normal kids who are into music get to do. And the time that I started to deviate it was around eighth or ninth grade when I met some friends and decided I wanted to join a punk band. So I started playing bass and doing that type of stuff. And then when I discovered DJs and raving and the whole scene, that was just another dimension. So my musical journey has kind of been like my whole life and just been adding on to it and augmenting it. So starting with instruments, moving to just emceeing vocals, getting into DJing, and then going, you know what, I want to just make everything and becoming a producer. So that's been since I was in the crib, literally, and now here I am. Fair enough. Now, I do want to dissect that a little bit and backtrack. What did you play in band? I played flute. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> okay, and as far as those different uh, influences, you mentioned a lot of different genres that you were kind of pulling from. Did you have, um, I guess, particular artists that were influential for you at that time? Um, and, oh. and maybe that they played a role in maybe the direction that, that you ended up taking with music? 
Yeah, you know, it's so interesting because I think a lot of people get into music through what their parents listen to, but my parents are in such a weird void in in some ways away from pop culture that, you know, I was always really jealous when I met people that were like, oh, I grew up listening to Motown and like this and that. And it's like, my parents were just very academic and they were a lot in their heads. And even though they enjoyed music, it was much more of a cultural anthropology, you know, hence the world music thing. Um, they're psychologists. They love finding out what makes people tick. So when I got into music and rebelled, I was kind of coming from almost a completely clean slate. And at that point, I was just at the mercy of the people I encountered. First punk and rock and definitely huge influence by all these renegade uh, punk bands all the way from the 70s to the 90s. You know, I liked the old stuff like uh, Black Flag, stuff like yeah. that, and newer stuff like No Effects too, because of course I was like 12 or 13. And for me, just the whole ethos of kind of writing your own script and not following someone else's really appealed to me because I was a weird kid, you know, I was a miscreant, like I was too nerdy, I didn't talk right, I wasn't wearing the right clothes, and all of a sudden when I discovered punk, it was just like, well, that's the point, we don't wear the right clothes, we don't say the right things, mm -hmm. and we're proud of that, you know, so that really shaped me, and then discovering DJ culture, it was weird because hip hop and I became best friends through electronic music, you know, uh, as a punk kid, there, the representation of hip hop in my school was like the suburban, you know, backwards hat, like, yeah. I want to beat you up, you skid type of thing. So I was just always like, uh uh, uh I'm not into that, like, that bro stuff. And then when I got into, uh, when I went into my first drum and bass party and I saw an MC there, um, and I started seeing people rapping over jungle and that whole thing, all of a sudden that was just like, an alternate entryway where I was yeah. like, wow, okay, there's a lot more to hip hop than this. So it's funny because most people I know that are super like heads, they have these stories about growing up and having an older brother with an MPC and getting into this. And for me, it was like, no, like I was just like, rappers? Oh, jerks. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> that electronic did this 180 for me where I was like, oh, wait, this is the real stuff. I just, I just didn't happen to go to high school with anyone who was like tapped into that and you know now it's such a different landscape because you can discover music without meeting a single person in your life yeah. on your base on the internet but at the time it was still very much word of mouth you know who's at your high school who's the weird kid that just transferred into your high school with djs like what is that and you know that was a big uh, resting point for me when i finally changed to my last school in 10th grade and i was central downtown that was like a hot spot there were rave flyers being passed out there were people selling mixtapes there was a record store down the street from my school and at the time i just walked into literally got a flyer decided to go to a party and that was life-changing so wow that is that is a lot to take from and a lot of different experiences that um i think that you were lucky to have. Not everyone has the opportunity to see so much and have the opportunity to um, really be exposed to different things and find out what they really might like. And, you know, speaking of that, that, that leads the question or begs the question rather that um, with your music and having such influence from all these different places, what, what does that do in terms of uh, your creative process? Oh, it's such a crazy, you know, I almost think it's like when you're making a collage and when you're younger, you're going through all these magazines and you're just frantically hunting for stuff and then you find something cool and you try to make it fit. My brain kind of goes through that every time I'm making a track because there are so many elements and textures and palettes that I love and they, they kind of are competing for space. So a lot of the time for me, I feel like I'm doing some sort of United Nations of like mediation inside my own head. Okay, you want to make a hip hop beat, but you also want that weird little industrial thing in there. How can we negotiate? So I feel like music for me is constantly this process because I love making things go together that aren't supposed to. You know, Chopped is my favorite cooking show. So like, mm -hmm. I'm, in, I'm really into the subversion of taking disparate elements and just, oh, we're gonna make it work. And that's kind of how we feel about life, you know? It's like, you can try and set your life up and have everything perfect and curate it and have one of those magazine-ready homes, or you can just kind of go through fighting with passion and I mean it sounds a little naive and romantic but that's also how I've been as a musician and it may have cost me some club points and some marketing strategies here and there but at the end of the day it's always just very much okay 
which direction is my heart bleeding? I'll follow the drops. <laughs> Got you. Okay. So it's more like you um, go in the direction you feel like as opposed to breaking things down to, you know, a, a very uh, pinpointed technical process then. Well, you know, that has changed because as I started doing a lot more back-end work and working in sync and licensing, you have to approach it that way because, you know, people come to you with a concept that they want. They want this style. They want this tempo. They want this length of piece. And then you have to reverse engineer it as it may be. So, yes, for my own work, mm -hmm. completely like that. But I've really learned a lot from having to take that process into account and go, okay, you're not just on your own time. Someone needs you to make soul R&B from this era. What are those characteristics? How do I pick this mm -hmm. part? And I do think that that has made me a better producer. So I, I would definitely recommend to those types of people like me to go, you know what, you can go outside your precious little emotional box sometimes and you can roll up your sleeves and have a technical objective and it's good for you, you know? It makes you think. Yeah, absolutely, and, and being a creative in general, I feel like takes a lot of talent. But um, are there any other talents that don't pertain to music that people may not be aware of? Well, you know, I've spent a lot more of my life than some people, I think, just on a singular pursuit. And about 10 years ago, I finally went, you know, I'm in danger of being one of those really myopic, uninteresting people that just can't have a conversation with anybody outside their inner circle. And that's not what I wanted to be. So I have a lot of very earthy hobbies. And it's funny because as a kid, like, I did not play outside. I was not sporty. I was very much this introverted, computer nerdy type of person mm -hmm. that you would expect. But now I purposefully seek out very opposite pursuits because I know, I think balance for me is just this theme that keeps coming back and forth in music, in life, in any kind of art. And so I do a lot of, you know, working out, yoga, cooking, gardening, um, just health and, and all these very sort of diametrically opposite things to sitting in a room and being on a computer because I was really burnt out before that. And now just the, the act of going, okay, I have to get up, I have to go outside, I have to dig in the dirt or I have to move my body. These are all things I have not been doing all day in the studio, let's mm -hmm. go. So I think that now people are, my fans and people who've been following me are kind of aware of this because I'm definitely that type of person who will post a recipe or go off about something right. wholesome every now and then. But I think that your average person who has an image of a super techie music producer DJ living in a high rise would be surprised for sure. Fair enough. Fair enough. And you know, here's, here's the thing that, that I really would like to inquire with you about because uh, you've, you've got a pretty long track record. You've done a lot of notable things. But now in going from kind of this uh, hobbyist to truly being a professional, what things were most notable to you about making that transition? The hugest, you know, is, I'm a teacher now uh, a lot of the time, so I spend a lot of time answering this question. And it 100% just comes down to work ethic because we all have ideas and some of us have really great ideas. And it's just like the difference between you and the professional is whether you get off your butt every day and just do the thing like and it may not be that you know you have all the connections and you can get the crazy release but mm -hmm. literally just actually doing the thing even us having an interview us us moving us not just sitting back and netflixing and falling into the void of cow pictures you know it's it's such a difference and i i know that on the days where i feel unmotivated and schlumpy and whatever the only thing that is separating me from being sort of a slug a potato is just hey there's something inside of me that's burning to get up and create this piece of art and carry it out and throughout all my different endeavors i watch people i see some people who are brilliant and uh, they cannot focus enough to get mm -hmm. one cohesive idea and Nobody will ever know how brilliant they are, you know? Yeah, yeah. So it's That's really it's... important to just do it. <laughs> yeah, and like you mentioned, um, you were talking a bit about, you know, staying motivated and doing the thing. Now, I know that when something becomes, um, when you mix business and intertwine that with a passion, sometimes it can become a little more difficult to maintain a certain level of interest in that passion. Um, if you face that type of thing, what, what kind of things do you do that keep you motivated in terms of continuing to push forward and do the thing as you uh, quoted? Well, I'm a perpetual student, you know, and I just, the way that I approach my life is that of a 
permanent learner. And I think that this is a good philosophy to take because for one, it keeps you humble. Like thinking that you're an expert and that you've got it all figured out is the best way to get stale, to get called out, to make a stupid mistake because you're just overlooking that, you know? Like I think that always approaching it as being uh, from a position of learning and humility just keeps me going, okay, that was uh, that release was good. I mean, how can I do better? Okay, mm-hmm. what is it about this person's music that I like that I don't have, and how can I, you know, absorb that inspiration and progress? How can I level up? And there's never been a point in my life where I've ever just been sitting back and being like, "Yep," you know. And there right. is uh, the caveat I'll give to that is there is a healthy balance with that too. Like you don't want to be so dissatisfied that you never stop to enjoy your life at all. And that's not what I'm saying, but to just to have the philosophy of, you know, yeah, I'm a good producer, but not only can I still always be a better producer, there's new technology coming out all the time. There's new techniques, there's new trends, there's new people. Like if you ever for one second, just think that you've got it all sewn up, you have lost your relevance. I think at that point, you know, a lot of the big artists that people look up to, people like, say, Diplo, I, I'm, you know, the jury's out for me. I don't know Diplo personally, and he has moments of coming across is not so great, but one thing he does really well is constantly adapt. He's constantly, whether he's, you know, whether he's getting his ideas from others or whether he's just being inspired, he is always upcycling. He's always moving forward and he's never, never just doing the same thing. And I think the big titans of, all these types of music recognize like they have you know look at madonna like she's like 100 years old and she's had how many styles and facelifts and albums but she's she's constantly like if electronic music was big madonna is the first one to have like some album with it on it you know like it's just very much i think people get so fixated and they're so static which is so interesting because society is changing really fast and in a way, I almost think that some people use it as a defense mechanism. You know, the yeah. world is crazy, whatever, but I got my skill set and I'm locked down and I'm just going to sit here and I'm just, I'm going to be okay. Right. And you no, know, challenge yourself, push. Like that's, that's what keeps yeah. me feeling energetic is keeping Fair this enough. And you know, I actually want to challenge you. I'm going to be that guy and ask one of the tough questions, but only because I feel like there are people that could benefit from the answer. So, <clears throat> A certain elephant in the room, oftentimes when it comes to the music realm, is you're a female. And you've likely had a different experience in the industry than maybe males would. Are there distinct advantages or disadvantages to that? And and really, I want to know how that affects your ability to do what you do and, and to be able to grow as an artist as well. Yeah, I mean, it's it's like a thing where it's 2020 and we should at this point be very aware that we don't have these biological differences in intellectual and creative capacities, but it's still a thing. And so, you know, that that's why I will still answer questions like these, because I think that there are still a lot of genuine gaps in people's understanding led by social conditioning and mm-hmm. You know, I think that it has kind of had a net zero uh, when I weigh it over my whole career because there's been a lot of setbacks, right? There's been a lot of judgment, there's been a lot of humiliation, a lot of condescension, but I do think that all of those things have made me super stubborn and, and very edgy to know the most that I can. And that was a huge motivator. Like I've never for one minute been lazy about knowing my programs because I expect to be questioned and I expect to be judged. And I expect, you know, it it was crazy when I first uh, started this professor position every week, I would go prepare for my classes and read the manual about 50 times. Like I hadn't been using the program for years. And there was this innate feeling of being terrified that for that one second, somebody would call me on a question that I didn't immediately remember. And then if I failed that question, it is the ruination of all women's reputation. And it sounds ridiculous, but it's really how people react is when they see a, a female artist who is less than amazing, or they see a woman writer or any type of you know figure screw up, there's always some sort of gender implication right. to the judgment on that. And so I think that like at the end of the day, 
wow, you know, I'm pretty proud of my knowledge level. And I think that maybe if I was just yet another guy out there, um, I might not have been quite as motivated to be so extreme with, with how much I know. Um, and then there's also like, yes, I have gotten certain gigs for being a girl, but I hate them. I don't like being, uh, and not, of course, you know, not the gig specifically or the promoter, just the concept of, right. okay, this is an all-female thing. And so now well, let's trot out the special show for the special people who can't be in a regular environment because they need their own cat. You know, it's just, it's very demeaning. So I think at the end of the day, there's been this push or pull. Yeah, sometimes I get more gigs. Sometimes I get less gigs because mm -hmm. people, people aren't putting me in high regard. Sometimes I get double questioned and treated like I don't matter. Sometimes I get diversity hired, you know? Right. So I think the, the, the honest truth is that there are a few benefits that a lot of guys will be sour about, like, oh, I get to do because I'm a girl, but then mm -hmm. those are countered by just as many setbacks and assumptions and, you know, other things. So I think at the end of the day, it really depends, and this goes for any gender identity, it really depends on what you do with hard times, right? It's just like, are you the type of person like that's kind of like me, which I get from my grandma, who is a Holocaust survivor. And to this day, I think that she lived to be 94 entirely on spite. I mean, she was poor, she was lonely, she had a lot of things going on, but she just learned how to like kind of sarcastically laugh at the world and just kind of make fun of the human condition to the point that she lived this very lucid, long and healthy life. And right. I think that's always inspired me to go, okay, yeah, you know what? I'm being judged. People have questioned whether I'm making this track or whatever for the 50th time. And you know what? I know twice as much as they do. And because of that, I'm going to put out another tutorial. I'm going to do another live stream. And so these have given me kind of benchmarks to push myself even more. And that's just the type of person I am. However, a lot of women, and again, this goes back to social conditioning, I think they tend to stereotypically be nurturing, be connecting, be community-minded, and when they get pushed like that, a lot of them just go, this sucks, I don't like this, I'm gonna go somewhere else where I'm wanted. So I could, you know, just as many people say, oh, there's not as many women producing, I know a lot of them who dabbled and tried and got humiliated or got treated like crap or compromised in some way and just went, you know what, I'm going to preserve my sense of self-esteem and do something else with less opposition. And I don't fault yeah. them for that. Because it's tough. Like, it's not now, a nice... With that, have you ever seen um, maybe a circumstance where there was some type of discriminatory behavior taking place or, or a circumstance that was kind of out of line where that person or that venue or, or whomever it may have pertained to got their comeuppance from it? Any cool stories? Oh, so many. I mean, at the end of the, there's been a lot of situations where I've sort of walked into the party, been treated like I didn't matter, and kind of just allowed it to go on as long as possible before the person is interrupted and, and made a fool. You know, like for instance, um, I remember coming to this one festival, and I just happened to arrive at the same time as this other male DJ who I know and I'm friends with. So we got on the golf cart together, and we were sitting, and the guy driving us is just sucking up hard to my friend, and I realized in about 10 seconds that he's just decided that this guy is the famous DJ, and I'm his girlfriend or something. So he doesn't introduce himself to me. He doesn't acknowledge, and, and this is, like, very common. And at this point, I'm just like, Whatever, I, I have nothing to prove and I don't really care about this person, so whatever. So, you know, keeps talking, keeps talking, keeps talking, gets him to the place, about to drop him off, and then somebody runs up to me and it's just like, oh, we've been looking all over for you. We want to make sure we have your technical rider. Do you, do you have your gear? Do you have all the stuff you need? Are you advanced? And, you know, we, we go through a complex five minute discussion, and I look back and I just see this guy kind of like saucer eyed, like, oh, oh, check out my SoundCloud, blah, 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 blah. So, I mean, I have like a hundred stories of you know so many times that that has happened and just as a shout out and a side note I have a project that I've been developing with some friends called we out here uh, which specifically inserts comedy in between a lot of our content and we do a lot of skits based on things that have happened to us in real life so uh, one of our most popular our first skit uh, took place in a green room and basically the plot line is uh, Megan who plays the headlining artist is getting kicked out of her own green room because People think that she's just someone's girlfriend or all of us. 
And I had four or five, you know, music producers, artists, women come in and play the roles. And there was hardly any script. We just sort of set the bones of the, the scene down and everybody was able to improv stuff that just actually happens yeah. that is absurdly funny when it's in that context. But when it's actually happening to you, you're just like, what twilight dimension am I in that this is still normal? So Yeah, you're, you're right. It's almost like uh, comedians. You know, you laugh hard when they're on stage uh, telling you these anecdotes. And then when you realize that it's come from a real place, it... You know, it's almost uh, unfathomable, unfa words, unfathomable um, that these things actually take place on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, now, you had also mentioned you have this project with your friends. Um, so the collaboration thing, I have noticed that you do do a good bit of collab in here and there. Now, are there any top prospects for whom you would collab with that you have not yet done so or would like to? Well, I mean, of course, I have my my heroes, my idols, people who like. I would absolutely love to collab with somebody like Bjork or Imogen Heap or any of these like really amazing, technological, innovating, beautiful souls, right? But in the real world, you know, I used to have kind of like, oh, this DJ, that DJ, and what I've started to learn is in these modern times, people are so inauthentic about the collab game now like I think that's my least favorite part of music because like used to be you know I'd call you up and be like yo hey like love your stuff let's work on something and you'd be like all right and like I think in EDMP we still do that and I, I've managed to find zones but now in the scene I call somebody up and it's just like oh yeah I might have a slot open in a couple months let me talk to my team about like when would be a good look for us to like discuss the blah 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 and, like how maybe we'll drop an insta story in like 17 weeks and a half but make sure that you repost it and I'm just like first of all do you like my music do you want like uh, do we have a connection so mm -hmm. it's really I think in this time um I've actually, and, and as you know, since running EDMP over the last few years, I've done a lot of collabs just with random people off of there. And for me, the magic is is meeting that special person who clearly is just like spinning around with joy in the musical universe and exploring all these things and is like excited. And, and that is sadly kind of a rare thing on the active circuit because when you're on the active circuit, you become like this slave to festivals and shows and my image of my team and this and that so I think that as things move forward I'm actually dying to collab with more interdisciplinary artists mm -hmm. just because that's something I haven't done a lot in my life I love art I haven't taken the time or made the time or had the time to get good at it or to do things like that so I'm really excited to work with animators and video producers and just really explore kind of multi-dimensional content, um, especially now that I spend a lot of time making weird custom controllers and devices in Ableton. I just can only dream about doing a more multimedia routine because I think the era of the DJ is is kind of gone, sadly. I mean, when I was growing up, we had Qbert, we had like mix master Mike, we had all these like insane turntables that were DJs, right? And I don't see very many of those anymore. I see a lot of cake throwers, I see a lot of table standards, and now that now that we're in this very interesting period of time that we're in, I really think that the quality is gonna show through, you know. And I don't I don't think that you can stand <laughs> on your bathroom. <laughs> shout, shout, and the throw cake at the live stream and I have the same effect so I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing what kind of new artists are brought forward by this focus on like the up close and in your living room type of vibe yeah so. absolutely and there there are a lot of people that are coming out of the woodworks that um, I, I almost find it interesting with something that you said too um, there's, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes uh, when you're trying to uh, kind of, for lack of a better term, pull something together for a collaboration, whether that be the person may have clout in mind, and that other person may, you know, give the response like you mentioned, oh, well, I got to check my X, Y, and Z, et cetera, so forth. Um, I find that a lot of people kind of have these assumptions that uh, climbing to some level of success may be an overnight thing, but they don't see those things take place even for people that are established. 
Um, and, and it almost makes me inquire the question here, or I shouldn't say almost, I am inquiring the question. For you and your journey, uh, what kind of behind the, th- behind the scenes things did you, maybe you experience in trying to achieve a certain level of success or dealing with um, the, the politics of things behind the scene? What, what was your experience like with that? Oh, I mean, it's completely like, you know, I, again, I come from this very, I don't want to call my family naive, but I mean that in the nicest possible way. We are not only kind of academic and in our own heads, but uh, my family is very altruistic. So, you know, my mom was always working, she was working with drug addicts in the mentally ill drug addicts, and my dad has been a therapist, and he also worked with brain injured kids. So I've just been used to growing up with the idea that you help people, you you know, that part of our mission on earth is to love each other. I sound like, I know I sound like a Teletubby right now, but so for me, my experience was, was extremely traumatic because I've just come in going, okay, I say this and I promise this, so I do that and I fulfill that. That's how I work. And just the concept of, you know, people sort of having designs on you from the moment they speak to you and having a purpose with every conversation was really hard to grasp. And, uh, I, I honestly think it's, it's taken me a lot longer in some ways because I was inside this little creative bubble of, oh man, it's just so great. I get to play my music everywhere. And this is, you know, so um, one of the biggest politics and sort of industry awakenings I had was watching the trajectory of my own career uh, depending on who was in it, you know, and have, realizing how little it had to do with me. And I think that's one important thing that a lot of artists really don't know or they forget is that so much of it is smoke and mirrors and so much of it is connections and nepotism and like, you know, yeah. and I'm not at all saying that talent isn't worthwhile, but I think that talent on its own has no power. Um, you know, you have to have that connection. So what I'm learning now is that, okay, these people exist. In fact, they're taking over. And we were not sure after this pandemic whether the only two bloodsucker major event companies will be left, for instance. So we may be entering a period of time where those politics have become like 1% and the bottom because it was already mm-hmm. heading there. Um, but, you know, I would experience the same thing of people saying, hey, oh, you're so hot right now, we want to be your friend, and then not having the right people, and all of a sudden, no, nobody's interested in you. Um, Around 2013, I had a really great management team going on, and it was a good kind of combination of young energy and like having somebody day-to-day who was in the scene with their foot on the ground, and then having another partner who was more experienced and connected. And when that was going on, I wasn't doing anything differently. I wasn't making better music. It wasn't working harder, uh, wasn't looking any better, you know, per se. I, I literally just had these two guys working for me and going out and hustling. And when it was working, it was, I was on top of the world. I was touring with like three different major electronic artists at once. Um, you know, everybody wanted a piece of me. I was on the road so much. Like I basically just left home and it was great. And, you know, it almost gave me the illusion that, oh, yeah, I'm going up. I'm My career is improving because I am progressing. And as you know, as an artist, you become, like, locked in with your work. Your work is you. Okay, I'm doing better. And then uh, in 2014, the two managers had a fight, and they went separate ways. And they said, either you're going to go with old, experienced guy or you're going to go with new promoter guy. And I didn't want to go with either of them because I knew it was working really well. But, you know, I went with older, experienced guy because I thought connections, those are what I don't have. Turned out that, you know, he was coasting on young foot on the ground guy to give him, like, cred and and relevancy. And he didn't want to take that work up. And pretty much overnight, I just, like, everything fell to pieces for me. And, again, wasn't doing anything different. Probably was even making better music because I was further along in my life. Uh, But all of a sudden could hardly get any bookings, was getting really bad bookings, was getting gaslighted by agents just being saying that like there was just no interest in what I was doing. And I feel lucky in a way to have had that experience because it was like the final detachment of me going, okay, I know that there is no sense in attaching my self-worth to these numbers because it is a complex web of other people's money and time. And of course, like it's not rocket science, of course if there's six 
people who think you're the best thing in the world and are emailing and texting and updating your Twitter, you can get more done, right? Yeah. So I think uh, the lesson or like the way that I've learned to make peace with the system, because there's two ways, you know, you can get really into it and become a brown noser or you can say, I hate this and screw the system. But my way is sort of to just make it uh, by networking with people who I actually like, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. uh, spending time with connecting and supporting people when I get that sense and you know when I click and I feel like somebody is a good person and they care and they're out there fighting the good fight and they're helping people out I will bend over backwards to be there and I don't need anything except to know hey I'm supporting an ecosystem of kinder people <laughs> and mm -hmm. in a way I think that's the era we're in right now you know we kind of have no choice we're stuck at home we have to start Kind of being nice to each other and helping each other out in a certain way, and I'm interested to see what happens next. Fair, <clears throat> fair enough. Goodness, that is it's it's funny because you kind of ran through some of the other questions that I was going to ask. Um, so I mean, that's perfect. That's a perfect way to um, answer. So with that, what I do have for you is uh, I've got a, a bit of an advice panel that I would like to throw your way. I had some uh, questions submitted for you. I uh, will not have enough time to jump through all of them, but I'll get a, let's see, we'll do a pick three. How's that sound? Sure, sounds good. All right, let's see. So this first question that I have for you says, do you still get anxiety about performing? If so, what do you do to face it and put on a good show? So it's interesting. Um, I have a really complicated, as some people know, performance setup. Uh, so it is anxiety inducing just on its own merit of technical magic, right? So in some ways I think when I look back that I introduced that aspect into my set to keep me anxious because I think in some ways that that anxiety is, is a huge push for a lot of artists like it's almost like getting that like defibrillator or that shot of adrenaline before the show like if I don't get that panic and that heightened awareness I'm much more likely to screw up because I'm not like it's, it's like a drug it's just like oh I'm full of that that panic so in some ways I think that maybe I made my setup so complicated to give me something to worry about because I do get extremely nervous but it's completely on the technical side you know at this point I feel like I could sing and rap and do all that stuff. That is supernatural for me, and I, I love it, and it actually calms me down. But just the, the real my computer work, did I bring all my adapters? Are all my cables in place? Ooh, ooh, ooh. Mm. Like, and, you know, and I have, um, in order to deal with it, I create these different systems to keep track of my stuff, and that's also a calming thing in itself, you know. If I'm packing for a show and I have a checklist, and just one by one, grabbing the cable and putting it off a checklist, it's almost like a, a meditation of sorts. Then when I get to the show, I need to pace back and forth, um, and I need like nobody to talk to me right before, and that's just kind of like a brain zero. That's just for me to flush out every stupid little thought or reaction uh, or anything and just get ready to go. So, um, I don't know. It's funny, my, my methodology for shows has always been that anxious butterfly feeling beforehand, and then I just toss myself out there, and my inner monologue says, all right, you, I mean, you out there, you can do it, or you can fuck up, and I know you don't want to fuck up, so go ahead. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, we need, we need that burning urgency for things, you know, and I think that one of the things that people have to remember during this time is that part of panic and stress and depression is having your deadlines and having your daily goals removed like that. Like, as much as we hate going to work, part of getting up and getting in the shower at 7 a.m. and putting clothes on, that is a ritual and that, like, in a way, relaxes certain parts of your mind. So I think, if anything, we all need to create these little rituals for ourselves to keep us calm. Fair enough. So I've got another question here for you. It says... Do you ever find yourself second guessing your releases? <laughs> Constantly, I, you know. There's a there's a saying uh, between me and everyone I know. It's like we're never sure if we have imposter syndrome or Dunning Kruger or both. <laughs> yeah. But I, I mean, I think the, the punchline to it, right, is that like 
um, everyone who has imposter syndrome thinks they're an imposter. No one who has done in Kruger thinks that they have done in Kruger. So it's, <laughs> it, I, I definitely am always freaking out, um, less than I used to. I think that obviously when you get more comfortable and technical and better over the years, mm. certainly not. But I will tell you that every year I look back on another year's worth of stuff before that and go, eh. So I think that there is a constant, if you are really an innovative and developing and technologically fascinated artist, you're going to be disappointed in yourself in some way, no matter what, because there's always something newer that's just come out. And there's always some new trick that you just learned that you could have done, could have, should have, would have, you know, and they have that saying about great art only being abandoned. So I try now to just make sure that I can technically be proud of this song because I already know that artistically I'm going to be at feeling 20 different types of ways over the next year. So I say, is the mix good? Is it sound up? Okay, no one's going to yell at me. I'm not breaking anyone's eardrums. Good, let it go. Let it go. And then I try to just keep moving on and, and do it better. Yeah, and, and you know, I can definitely identify with that myself. These um, I've actually removed things that I've released because that's that mindset has got a hold of me so bad at times. Um, I think that it really is much harder for maybe people that are starting out because uh, they may be thinking of it as, you know, this is my foot in the door. This is my first impression. If, you know, if the next thing is 20 times better, will they listen to the next thing if the first thing wasn't up to par? Um, yeah, I've, I've heard a lot of that type of thing, dealt with a lot of t uh, that type of thing with artists that I've recorded for that I'm like, okay, yeah, the track's fine. It might not be number one in my playlist, but I mean, if it's good to go, you know, there's a niche for everything. Um, mm -hmm. I, I try to tell people there's a lot of garbage on the uh, radio that I will, or, or even from, from up and coming artists that I would gladly roast, easily roast, but I mean, hey, they're in that position. They created that position for themselves, regardless of what I think, and other people can do the same with their music. Um, speaking of, the next question here you got is, what would you be doing if you weren't doing music? <laughs> um, well, you know, at this point, I have, I've got to admit something to myself, and this is something I've denied all my life. Because my parents were therapists, they, they always have sort of, you know, helping people, work with people, and I was like, I want to do anything but that. But I started to realize that my entire life has been an expression of therapy through different means. <laughs> so as much as I've been hiding it from myself, part of the reason I do music is to give some other random person who I don't know a possible moment of joy or transformation or love or inspiration or anything you know and part of the reason I wanted to become a touring artist was to go travel and meet the people on the other side of the speaker you know and, yeah. and to just really so I think that whatever I would do it would be something involving inspiring and working with people and you know most recently I've been teaching and I've actually really realized like how much I just care about all the people who I connect with, even if it's one class, you know, as soon as I cross paths with another person and I see the urge to be creative in them, all I want to do is stoke that fire. So I think that whatever I would be doing, it would be something that really pushes people to find those moments of joy and things that are not necessarily practical, you know, like I respect doctors. I'm not necessarily a doctor, but I'm kind of like a doctor of the, of the soul. <laughs> no, I, I definitely think people. that's fair. I think that's beyond fair. So, hey, as a wrap up, let me ask you this. Are there any other projects or promotions that you have going on that you'd like to tell people about? Oh, so much. Um, I'm working right now on finally finishing an album with Frost, who's been my collaborator for years. Uh, but we've both just been so busy with everything else that we do that our album has been very slowly coming to its climax. And we have one song left. So um, the collab album is going to come out. We're still arguing about a name, but I'm really enjoying the fusion and the collab with the project. Recently, I just put out my own EP, Unleashed, and that's out on Moody Music right now. Um, it's only been out for a couple weeks. My camera is being floozy. Let me just... Oh, hey, are you back with me? 
There you go. And um, yeah, so recently I did that. Um, and let's see, there's several other projects that are all going on in the background. I'm doing a very cool collab that I'm really excited about uh, for a New York Times award-winning journalist named Ian Urbina. Uh, he wrote a book called The Outlaw Ocean, which is the result of five years at sea investigating all kinds of funny business, uh, sea slavery, illegal dumping, you know, climate change, any sort of issue. He collected recordings for the whole time he was on the road and basically contacted a couple hundred of his favorite artists after the fact and asked them to work on this continuous project to release albums and kind of bring awareness to the topic. So this for me is exciting in so many ways because I love the ocean, I love nature, I also love field recordings, and I like to obviously try to make a difference with music. I don't like to just feel like I'm creating art in a vacuum, so really excited about that. I'm working on that now. And once that's done, I will actually be launching an entire new, entirely new project possibly in the fall, possibly early next year, but that's something I've been building up for years. I've used the name Alicia for over 20 years now, and it's kind of a, a part of me that is long left behind in a way. I've sort of been growing from it slowly. Mm -hmm. Unleashed was, was the metaphorical sort of skin shedding and, and getting ready to move on. So. Anyone who likes my stuff, just sort of stay tuned and there will be some new directions and new styles, more chill stuff, more vocal oriented stuff and just kind of new directions. That is awesome. Well, I thank you so much for joining me and for you guys out there as well. Um, I just want to say if you would like to, I'm going to put a link in the description. Feel free to join the community. If you already have not become a member, that's going to be the discord.gg slash EDMP. Feel free to join us for plenty of music related subject matter, tutorials. It's an awesome community. We host contests from time to time, that sort of thing. But again, I'd like to thank my guests one last time and I appreciate you guys for watching. We'll see you next time. Thank you.